Okay. It appears as if we are on. We are live on YouTube. Welcome to the Broken Arrow Sky Race Elite Women's Panel. My name is Dylan Bowman. We are broadcasting live on okay. the Broken Arrow YouTube channel. It appears as if oh, we are Hold on, on. see our we first technical issue here. I gotta YouTube. hit uh, mute on my live stream here so that we don't get feedback. I apologize for that. Again, this is only the second time I've done this, but again, welcome to the Broken Arrow Sky Race Elite Women's Panel. My name is Dylan Bowman. I'm very excited to host and moderate this panel with some incredibly talented and intelligent women in our wonderful sport of trail and ultra running. To my left, I have Hillary Allen. Hillary, maybe wave a little bit. Below her, Corinne Malcolm. Morgan Aratola directly beneath me. And then last but not least, Caitlin Gerben. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I just want to say uh, at the beginning here, of course, we are doing this in collaboration with the Broken Arrow Sky Race. If you are unfamiliar, Broken Arrow Sky Race is an amazing race that usually takes place in June every year. At this place, it's gonna, or this year, it's gonna be taking place from October 1st to 3rd. It takes place in Olympic Valley, California on the hallowed grounds where our sport began. And my name is Dylan Bowman. As I said, I am the founder of Pillars. We are a media and training company in the sport of trail and ultra running. And I am very excited to have partnered with the Broken Arrow Sky Race, with the race director, Brendan Madigan, and with the entire community that surrounds this awesome race. And tonight I have the honor of spending at least about the next hour with some women who I really admire in this sport. I want to allow each one of you guys to just provide a quick intro as to who you are, where you're broadcasting from, and what you do outside of the sport of running, because I think each and every one of you has uh, unique skills and talents. So maybe, Hillary, let's start with you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming and joining us. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, and thanks, Dylan, for the intro. Um, yeah, so... Like I said, I'm Hillary. I currently, right now, I'm actually in Leavenworth, Washington. I'm on a big road trip. Uh, it's something that I really like to do, explore new places. Um, and so in addition to running for the North Face, um, I also do gravel bike racing. I actually just came off of a gravel bike stage race. It's super fun. More runners should try it. Um, and in addition to that, I have a master's degree in neuroscience and physiology um, and structural biology. And uh, I've used that in the past to teach. Um, COVID kind of put a stop on that. Um, but and I'm also a running coach as well. So kind of trying to dive into all of these uh, different sciencey things. And I recently wrote a book, Out and Back, um, and yeah, I think that's about sums it up. Amazing. Welcome, Hillary. Corinne, why don't we go to you next? Hi, I'm Corinne Malcolm, and I'm coming to you from the Outer Sunset in San Francisco, California. Um, I feel like I'm a jack of all trades. I run for Adidas Terex. Um, I like the long, long stuff. Um, I come from a ski background, um, akin to Morgan, who's also joining us today. And um, I write, I coach, I apparently am now a live broadcaster um, as of this <laughs> last weekend, and I have a degree in environmental physiology, so specifically looking at heat and altitude adaptation. Amazing. Morgan, you next. Sorry, let me unmute. I have um, a dog that sounds like a pig. So if you hear barn noises, I'm actually not in a barn, but it's my dog. Um, I'm Morgan. I run for the North Face. I am currently coming at you from Carbondale, Colorado. And I know I am very lucky to be calling. The Roaring Fork Valley. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a good spot. So I am here. Uh, currently I'm working at a reclaimed lumber, um, business uh, as an office manager, and I'm awaiting grad school, which begins next year, uh, to get a master's in counseling. And yeah, I run, I came from a ski background, cross-country skiing and started running kind of as competitively ish <laughs> when I stopped skiing around 2011. So, um, yeah, it's, uh. I feel like I 
don't belong on this panel in a lot of ways. So Morgan, thank you for having me. <laughs> I just have to say that there's going to be no humility allowed on this panel tonight. You are an Olympic Nordic skier. You are a former Olympian. So please don't, yeah, yeah please, please don't uh, have any humility. You should be bragging about that. Certainly if I was an Olympian myself, I would start every single conversation acknowledging that. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Announcing that publicly. <laughs> but welcome, Morgan. Thank uh, you. Great, great to have you here. Uh, Caitlin, why don't you just uh, round things out before we get started? Yeah, uh, I don't know how to follow up an Olympian, but I'm <laughs> going to try. So I'm Caitlin Gerben. Um, I'm calling in from my home in Issaquah, Washington. So not too far away from Hillary and not too far away from Dylan or also where Corinne spent a good chunk of time too in Washington. So um, I am yeah, an athlete for the North Face and I love long distance running, um, but I also do a lot of other stuff in the mountains. So basically any combination of sports that allows you to move quickly through the mountains. So skiing and splitboarding, climbing, mountaineering, I kind of love all that. And now due to a recent injury, I'm also a swimmer. So I got to add that to the resume because I've done way more swimming this year, probably than I have running at this point. Um, yeah. And then when I'm not doing athlete stuff, I have a PhD in bioengineering and I work at a nonprofit research institute in seattle called the allen institute we do cell biology research it's so cool and the reason why i asked you all to sort of introduce what you do outside of sport as well is because all of you are so ambitious and successful professionally you're all intellectually curious and uh have contributed a lot not only in the sport of running but also to your respective fields i just want to say before we sort of get into some topics of conversation that I sort of mentioned this before we got started, but this can be very conversational. I'll ask some pointed questions to you all individually, but generally I'll introduce sort of broader topics and just allow you guys to kind of riff on them. And also to our live audience, welcome. We're super happy you're here. Please do be interactive. We do have a live chat going on. So if you would like to ask questions of our guests here tonight, we would absolutely encourage you to place those in the chat, we'll monitor those and we'll sort of pepper those in as we can. So I guess, first of all, because uh, we're coming off uh, the weekend that was Western States, obviously that's the, the big news in the sport of trail and ultra running. And it was an incredible race uh, overall, but specifically the women's race was one for the ages. Corinne and I were lucky enough to have a front row seat calling the action. So I wanted to just uh, sort of bring that up First, and maybe Corinne, I'll have you start since you and I did have that front row seat and just ask of any general takeaways about the race itself and the uh, current landscape within women's trail and ultra running. I've been thinking about this one a lot because people have been asking me about it a lot. You know, why, why this year? Why did the women perform so well? And what my general consensus is, is that the women did not perform well because the conditions were hard they performed well despite the conditions being hard and i think that that is you know despite you know they they i don't know they overcame what so many other people couldn't in the race you know the the average we had 66 percent finishing so you know a pretty low you know, like a high high dropout rate um the men's race in particular really fell apart um, and so despite all those things despite that trend the women ran you know as good as ever um, and so I think that that goes to, you know, grit, it goes to, um, more self-control and poise maybe within that, within that group of women. And then the depth of the field and the depth of the field is growing as more and more women, women come into the sport as more and more women get funneled into, um, races that are really competitive like Western States. Um, but I think the big takeaway is that it's not, they didn't perform better because, you know, because the conditions were hard, they performed better despite the conditions being hard. And I think that that is just like a very powerful message to walk away from this weekend with overall, like very, very exciting to see how that continues this season and into 2022 and beyond. A hundred percent. Caitlin, you're a three-time top 10 finisher at Western States. Did you watch the race unfold this weekend? And if so, what were your reactions? So I am very sad to say I actually didn't because I was with other women on a bachelorette <laughs> camping weekend out of service, <laughs> which I was really bummed about initially, but also, I mean, maybe we'll get into injury stuff too, but 
being injured, I feel, felt like I was just so torn, like not being able to go back. First of all, making the decision not to go back and race um, two years ago, which then led to not racing this year, but also even being injured um, and not being able to really like be on my feet for that long to crew or, or pace. Um, but the first thing I did when I got back into service was check the results. And the first thing that my husband Ellie told me about it was how many women were in the top 10 and how many were in, women were in the top 20. Um, so I'm just so stoked about that. And I think just to add to what Corinne said that, you know, tough conditions, I think really favor smart and patient runners. Um, and I, I think a lot of us here can on this panel can relate to that. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not surprised to see the results as they were. And I hope that seeing how well women did this year is not a, a one-time thing. I hope that that kind of sparks the creativity a little bit more for years to come where that just becomes the new normal. Yeah, hundred percent. Hillary, Morgan, I don't know if you guys had any reactions to it. Of course, we don't need to spend all evening on Western states. We've all talked about it enough so we can move on unless uh, you guys want to maybe pepper in your own perspective from the race. Okay, we'll move on. Morgan, I wanted to, t to, uh, to ask you, of course, we uh, already spoke about the fact that you are a former Olympian in uh, Nordic skiing. Uh, it's really remarkable. Obviously, not many people can say that about themselves. And since retiring from the sport of Nordic skiing, you've been a force on the mountain running scene as well. You've won the U.S. Mountain Running Championship at least twice uh, that I can remember. You've won the, the vertical kilometer at Broken Arrow, who is our host uh, party tonight. Um, so I love just because you're you're less active on social media. People don't, <laughs> you're sort of one of those like quiet crushers. I'd love it if you just kind of like fill both us and the audience in on your story a little bit. Like what, what was it like to be an Olympian and what kind of dedication did it take to, to compete at that level? Yeah, I think it's um, it's funny. Actually, this year is the first year I raced um, the GoPro games a couple weeks ago. And it's the first race I've done in about a year and a half. And it's the first time I felt old <laughs> when I looked at the results. And I was like, when did, what, when did I not be stop being 20? Like I'm 15 years <laughs> older than people now. Um but I, so I cross country skied competitively on, I was on the U.S. ski team for about six years. And yeah, I mean, it's a definite sacrifice. I think a lot of sports running in particular seems to be after high school, it's pretty normal to go to college and run for a college and then turn pro and skiing it's you turn pro as soon as you can. At least it was back when I was doing it. And so you give up a lot of time and kind of you know, life just takes a different path. And so I mentally kind of checked out around 2010, which was the Olympics and then physically checked out around 2012. So, you know, I kind of have mixed emotions about the Olympics. Um, it's a very Americanized uh, maybe North America more so um, event and for cross country skiers um, in Scandinavia and Europe, it's just a bigger event every year to have like world cups and world championships. So the Olympics almost seemed like small fiddles compared to the big orchestra. That's like world oh. championships in Oslo. Um, and then also just to go and not ski well, cause you're just so physically and mentally burned out was challenging. So it's a weird relationship I've had with uh, sport in general. So that's kind of why I started running because I just, no one really knew you. All you needed was shoes and I could just show up and, and run. And um, I have never let myself take it too seriously because I saw what it did to my kind of perception of Nordic skiing and it really took me oh. down the road. So, I mean, I've never, turned on a GPS watch or put on a heart rate strap or anything since I stopped Nordic skiing. Whoa. And yeah, I just kind of am somewhat dumb about things. And now, you know, life has other things going on than training twice a day. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's always a funny transition. I feel like I reverse retired. So I'm kind of going backwards in some ways, but, um, 
I like it. And I, uh, broken arrow has always been a fun event. So that's why I keep coming back to it. But yeah, I'm not a big social media person. Anyone that follows me pretty much just knows my dog and not me. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thanks for sharing that Morgan. Yeah. And, and it, it does make sense. Uh, you know, I'm always somebody who is like, why doesn't Morgan race more? She's so talented. She always does these amazing things. You win U S mountain running championships. You compete, at the world mountain running championships. I think you led team USC, USA to a gold medal at least once in the world mountain running championships place super high when you did that. And, uh, uh somebody, uh, in the chat has also pointed out that you've won the 26 K at broken arrow as well. So you've won the VK three times you've won the 26 K at least once. And of course those races are only separated by a day, I believe, but Morgan, it's great to have you here. And it's great to Thank learn you. your, your story a little bit more. And it, brings up, uh, you know, another thing that I think is really unique about this group specifically in that you're all diverse athletes and you all have sort of touched on this in the introductions that you provided about yourself. Corinne, I know you came from sort of like a, a Nordic ski biathlon background as well. Maybe talk about that and, and how that set you up for your running career. Yeah, honestly, I can nod along to Morgan's story a lot because I feel like my story is, has a lot of, I don't know, connected threads to that. I dropped out of college to pursue biathlon and made the senior national team really quickly um, after like one year as a junior um, and just didn't go back to school. Like I, I thought it was going to be a, a gap year, essentially partway through college. And instead it turned into moving into the Olympic training center and um, pursuing an Olympic spot for the 2014 Olympics. Um, I started skiing later than a lot, a lot of kids start skiing when they're really little. And I didn't start Nordic skiing until high school. And so had a little bit of a, I feel like wasn't, I burnt out a little bit later maybe, but, um, was on a team where, you know, the environment at that point in time was very much like the goal was to keep up and it made me very good, very quickly, but it also destroyed me very quickly. Mm. And, um, they now have like a development program and some other stuff kind of that I think both protects, but also allows slower growth and development of athletes. That's more sustainable. Um, and my kind of age group just got, you know, if you're in the wrong spot, you're kind of in the wrong spot. And so I, um, basically retired partway through Olympic trials for the 2014 Olympic games, just cause I was so sick. Um, I was super, super overtrained and Anyone who's listened to me before on with, with Jason Coop or yeah. things I've written for I Run Far know, know that story a little bit that um, I basically, I retired from athletics. I went back to school and when I started exercising again, I mean, it was just going in the mountains. It was the cross training I had done for skiing. It was like, oh, we're going to go for a run with my friends in the hills and like bring snacks, like awesome. Um and so actually my entry into trail running was through sky racing, um, particularly like the U.S. sky circuit at that point in time, which was like the rut um, in Big Sky, Montana and the Flagstaff Sky Marathon and the Crystal Mountain Sky Marathon, actually kind of right, you know, right in Caitlin's neck of the woods. Um, and for me, that was like a natural jumping off point just because it was it was what I knew from ski training. So I took some time off and then my entry back into running. I had grown up running, um, didn't run in college. And then, yeah, like sky running made sense because you got to not run so long, but you got to be in the mountains for a long time just because the courses are slower. And that really spoke to me. And from there, I've just kind of tried to push, push the boundaries of how far I can go now. And so, yeah. but, and but now, I sky, now sky races are like basically the, the, the appetizer <laughs> to the entree for, sure. for you. But uh, I think that I just like, just to finish up real quick, um, I think that a lot of athletes, that's like kind of their, their entry point is something maybe a little bit different. Um, they're looking for something new and it kind of becomes this safe spot. And I understand what Morgan said about not taking yourself seriously, because I feel like, you know, that's a, it's a protective mechanism in a lot of ways to keep it really as relaxed as possible. So I think a lot of us feel that for sure. Totally. And Corinne, you're now a professional coach and I'm sure that experience of deep overtraining is probably informed how you approach the training that you provide to other athletes as well. So even though it was a tough part of your life, I'm sure that experience has helped to uh, develop other athletes in a way that is a little bit more healthy. So sticking on the subject of athletic versatility, Hillary, you've been ripping around on your gravel bike like crazy. Um, and, you know, just generally would love your perspectives on just being more of a balanced person 
uh, both, you know, with your, your running and with other athletic pursuits that you have and maybe what you've seen as a benefit from running your bike so much. Yeah, so this is actually the one piece of information to circle back to Western states and not to say that, you know, you need to have a guy do well at a race for anyone to notice that cycling is actually good for for ultra runners. Um, but Jim Wamsley is a perfect example of that. So for people who actually, you know, don't believe it from the ladies who've been doing it for a long time <laughs> and me included, um, the proof is in the pudding, Jim Wamsley winning Western States on a significant amount of bike training. So um, from my experience, it's made me super fit. Um, obviously there's nothing that can, can, you know, um, replace running, um, especially from like, you know, movements and, and specificity for a running race. Um, but cycling has been amazing for me to just explore, um, you know, different trains at different speeds and learn a different skill. It's really interesting to learn an, as an adult, a new skill and to be completely humbled, come into it as an elite athlete, but not being an elite cy cyclist. And, um, I welcome that it's, it's so much fun. Um, and it's been a tool for every recovery that I've faced thus far, um, that, and I'm having more and more fun with it, learning more and more. Um, and, I mean, I'm also a coach. And so I think, uh, you know, with, when athletes, um, whether they're, you know, they're injury prone or they're going through an injury or they just like doing other sports besides running, it's always something I encourage. Um, and yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great point, Hillary. And it's something actually the European side of the sport has been, has had figured out for a long time, you know, yeah. You, you see Francois Dane spending a lot of time on his bike, Pau Capel, Nuria Picas. A lot of the top European athletes do a lot of their training on a bicycle. And you're right to point out that Jim, <laughs> Jim did a ton of his pre-Western States block on a bike trainer. Motivated me to spend an hour ripping around on my, uh, my bike trainer this afternoon. And uh, Caitlin, to bring you into this part of the conversation, you're so skilled in the mountains. You mentioned that you love to do basically anything uh, that involves kind of moving around in the mountains, whether it's climbing, skiing, alpinism. You did the Mount Rainier Infinity Loop. And for our viewers, please do Google that. It's absolutely astounding. And you just generally sort of like really push the women's side of mountain sport sort of to the next level. And I wondered what you wanted to say as it relates to this conversation of being versatile as an athlete, spending time in the mountains and how that's helped you in competition as an ultra runner. Yeah. I mean, I think like everyone has kind of said here, I think it, it helps to diversify, not just in building strength and endurance, but also just keeping it fun and fresh. And I like my, my entry into trail and ultra running really came through backpacking and mountaineering. Um, I just wanted to start exploring if I could go the same distance, but in less time. Um, and, and, you know, so I think like it all really comes back to like how you connect with a place and how you want to move through it. And I think when it comes down to it, like if you pick a cool route to do, it doesn't really matter if you're running it or hiking it or climbing it or skiing it, it's all still a, kind of a new way to experience that terrain. And I just find a lot of um, joy in, in going out and doing things in kind of a different style. Um, and I also think like, it's important to me to make sure that, you know, I, I know there's like, especially with this last year, like with COVID and races being canceled and FKTs being like a really big push and big draw. I think that's, that's awesome. And I do really love doing things in that style, but at the same time, I just think like, there's so much, um, I don't know, I get a lot of satisfaction just out of like covering terrain and it's not always about going really fast um well certainly it, it can be but I just think like there's a lot of exploring to do and a lot of skills to develop and um I you know in, in off seasons and even in the middle of my seasons I try to to set aside time um to develop different skill sets in the mountains because I think it just really opens the door for what kinds of things you can do Thanks so much for sharing that. And on this subject, there's some people in the chat who are curious about strength training regimens. And Corinne, your, your regimen was called out specifically. And I think this is actually something that's really important to talk about. Uh, it's something that I only recognized much later in my career, just how much of an unlock it is, not only for performance, but durability and 
for still feeling strong and athletic as we age. So Corinne, maybe you can start us off on the strength training subject. You're also a coach. How do you strength train and, and how do you advise your, your athletes to strength train? So I'm laughing because my roommate plugged this question and it's because the, her joke was that my strength, my unorthodox strength training is all the cardboard boxes our household has to break down every week because things just keep appearing at our house um, since we moved in a year ago. Um, so that's the unorthodox part is that we break down a lot of cardboard boxes to try to fit it in our little city recycling bin every week. But um, I do actually really like strength training. I climb a lot. Um, throughout the year, I try to make a point of going on two or three climbing trips. Um, and it's been a really, just like what Hillary said about learning a new skill as an adult, didn't grow up climbing, started climbing as a 30 year old. Um, so like 18 months ago, basically two years ago. And, um, to me, it's been the really fun skill set to pick up and to try to like, to, and to suck at, like, I'm really bad at it. Like I'm not mobile or flexible and I over muscle things. Um, but coming from a ski background, I really I've always loved the weight room. It was one thing that I really, really enjoyed as a, as a high school athlete, as a college athlete, um, you know, being able to crank out a bunch of pull-ups or dips or something and really shock people or surprise people that as a girl, you can do that stuff. Um, but our household has a, we've, we've really gone all in on our gym. I think Caitlin's got a ski erg as well now. So, um, we, we own a, a, a ski erg you've seen probably in CrossFit competitions, but it's a Nordic ski training tool. And since, um, suffering some pelvic stress fractures this winter, I've spent a lot of time on the ski erg. There's been some video footage floating around of, of that, I believe, but we, we do, we, we prioritize strength, I think in our household, um, realizing that that makes us very durable, um, runners and very athletic individuals. And I think that that goes a long way in the sport. I coasted on ski strength for a long time and didn't do any strength. And then that ski strength started to fade and the niggles started to creep in. And since then, um, it's been good. And my partner had shoulder surgery this winter. So this is like the one time in recent years where I can like do more pull-ups than him. And I'm like, totally, <laughs> working as fast as I can to stay, stay ahead of him as he does PT to rehab his shoulder. So our, our household, I think has just gone all in on this mentality of being really durable as athletes so that we can do all the sports and do, and do them safely. Cool. I want to open the strength training thing up to everybody else here on the panel, but also there's some great uh, sort of chat in on our YouTube live about training for broken arrow specifically. It's obviously a mountain race. It's at altitude. So I know Hillary, Corinne, you're both coaches, Caitlin and Morgan, you guys are both great in the mountains as well. Any uh, advice that you'd give to maybe lowlanders, people who might be a little bit intimidated about mountain races or who maybe don't do super well at altitude of how they can get prepared for Broken Arrow specifically? Whoever wants to take that, maybe Hillary? Yeah, I was gonna say, um, so I've done Broken Arrow um, and that's, you know, mountain races are kind of my favorite, um, sky races in particular. And so Broken Arrow is a loop course. Um, so it's a 26K and then if you do the 52 kilometer race, you obviously do that twice. Um, it's a mix of some runnable terrain um, in the first half is, and then some pretty steep and, and rocky um, uphills and descents. Um, and actually I got my start in ultra running when I lived in Denver, Colorado. So I was actually running in a city. And so uh, for me, it was, you know, being using my time wisely, um, you know, kind of um, doing my week runs when I had less time working on kind of overall fitness and just, you know, getting more fit, um, so sh kind of short and high intensity and then using my long, my weekends for kind of longer runs. Um, and I think, uh, just to kind of, uh, go back on the strength training, uh, piece, that's a really good way to kind of, if you don't live in a, in a place where you have access to, to mountains, strength training is a really good way to build kind of that and, and load your muscles like eccentrically to prepare for the downhills, which a lot of people, that's where you get most sore from. Um, and so there's a lot of creative ways that you can prepare for it. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, using your time wisely and, you know, getting in the gym when you don't have actually access to steep trails. Caitlin, you also, I mean, you live outside Seattle, you have mountains nearby, but any advice that you would give to people who maybe live in a place that doesn't have great access as to how they could prepare 
uh, for a race like Broken Arrow? Yeah, I, I, would, I mean, I think I agree with everything that um, Corinne and Hillary said. I would just say with with the strength stuff, find a simple routine that works with for you and stick with it. You don't need a bunch of fancy equipment. You don't need to be lifting, I don't know, huge racks next to the bros in the gym. Like just like find, find like ideally, you know, work with someone who knows what they're doing, um, who can help you identify like different aspects of maybe like your strength and weaknesses that you could work on and then just stick with that routine. Um, I've historically been so bad at doing PT and strength work. Um, so a trick that I used, I've graduated past this, thankfully, but years ago <laughs> I used to have a calendar and I would just give myself different colored stickers, like a kindergartner on like a star sheet. <laughs> so for like days that I did PT, you got a different sticker and days that I like did something else for my recovery or like ate like a really like great meal that I was happy about. Or, you know, I don't know, like all, all these different like other aspects that's not just mileage um, as a way to kind of reward yourself for making those choices to invest in your health. So it's a great point. And I love the, the, the fact that the strength and the, the preparing for mountains thing is actually intertwined uh, in that building our strength can actually make us a little bit more prepared for a course like Broken Arrow, which of course does have so much climbing and descending and does require so much strength and it does require fitness, but strong athletes will be more resilient and probably have a better time on that difficult course. Morgan, I know, you know, Nordic skiing is one of the hardest freaking sports there is <laughs> like really one of the most, uh, I think challenging and the uh, sport that really does combine the strength and the fitness. Uh, are I know that you still coach Nordic athletes, you still Nordic ski yourself. How is that, uh, strength sort of translated to your running? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the nice things about Nordic skiing is like every modality of training helps it. Um, specific strength. I'm a gym. I love the gym. The more bro bra, dirty gym, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Um, uh -huh. so I still lift about three times a week. And even through our Nordic career, you're in the gym three times a week, um, for hour and a half to two hours, less during the like heavy, um, racing periods, but you know, Olympic lifting and heavy and periodized with, you know, hypertrophy and power and, um, mobility, stability stuff. So I've always loved to lift. And I think, you know, my injuries in general are from me doing stupid things, not because of, you know, like beating my body up, which maybe I just don't train enough. So that's probably it. But um, yeah, I think, I think people also overthink strength and with a race like broken arrow or even during the pandemic, I know I was in Oregon then and everything was shut down. And so I went to Fred Meyer and bought two 60 pound sandbags. And I just like did walking lunges up and down the sidewalk with my 60 pound sandbag on my back. And it doesn't have to be complicated. You can grab that and do step ups, um, to mimic that uphill motion. Um, but yeah, I think, in general, people are really good at getting in their own way and it, it doesn't have to be that complicated to get strong. So you have to just make use of what you have. And so depending yeah. on where you are. Yeah. Sort of what Caitlin said in that it doesn't have to be really fancy. You don't need really expensive equipment. You can go get sandbags and yeah. get your, get yourself swole that way. <laughs> so thank you guys all for your perspectives on that. And I think it good segue from here is just like the whole topic of dealing with injury. Of course, we're talking about how strength builds resilience. And then obviously when we do get injured, it is the time when we pay attention to our strength and our mobility, and we're sort of forced to prioritize it again. And I know three of the four of you are returning from fractures right now, returning to health from fractures, serious injuries. Caitlin, you posted today about how you're getting back on the Alter G uh, as you're returning to health now. Um, so maybe tell us what you're dealing with, how your, your, what your journey has been like. And, and one of the things I'm curious about with you specifically is like, your career was going like this, right? Like you won Trans Grand Canaria after three top tens at Western States. 
you then break the FK, smash the FKT on, on the Wonderland Trail, and you're really like emerging as one of the best in the world. At, and then you're dealt this really serious blow. So maybe talk a little bit about what the injury is that you're dealing with and what your journey's been like. Yeah, so um, you're right that <laughs> dealing with a fracture. So I found out that I had a stress fracture in the neck of my femur, which is a really serious location, um, high risk, um, because the concern is that if that would advance to a full fracture, which is always a concern with stress fractures, then that's like a career ending injury. So it's really like not something to mess around with. So also getting that diagnosis was really hard for me to hear because I, I've been running for 10 years and competing with essentially zero running injuries. Like the only injuries I've ever had have been from stupid falls snowboarding. Um, so I've never had real serious injuries. I feel like I've always been really proud of how I've listened to my body and really respected the rest and recovery aspect of my training um, and taking off seasons and everything. Um, and then also like I had never had any, I like didn't have any pain on that side. It really just kind of showed up as like something feels just a little funky. And then, you know, two weeks later it was still kind of there and then, oh my gosh, it's a serious injury. So um, yeah, that was, that was tough to deal with, especially as I was like starting to plan out what this year was going to look like. Um, and so I really just uh, leaned hard into other, <laughs> other activities. Um, I actually, made a list of like eccentric hobbies and crazy things that I wanted to do with my life. And I've actually, most of them I haven't done or even like really pursued, but just like, just taking the time to do that and like remind myself that there are other ways to fulfill this like curiosity and competition and adventure and all the stuff that I can't do right now um, as a runner. I think that was really helpful. So I've gotten really into swimming. I'd always kind of swam here and there just for recovery or, you know, every once in a while when I did have an injury, but now I'm like getting into open water and I just got a wetsuit and I'm, so I'm swimming in the lakes and like all these things that I, I had actually tried this a couple of years ago and freaked out and like, couldn't do it. And now I'm just like going in the water every day and it's awesome. Um, and I never would have expected that I would find so much like enjoyment in something like that, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a long and slow process, but I'm happy to be able to start seeing, like getting kind of to the other side of that. So I just, as you mentioned, I was on an alter G treadmill this morning. That's my second time on it. And if people aren't familiar with those, they're basically like machines that treadmills that you can offset your body weight. And so you can have like, you know, less what you can prescribe with the percent body weight. And then, um, try that. So I don't know, that's a crazy thing I'd never done before. So that's kind of weird, but it's, it's fun to, to find other ways to, to get back to, to doing what I, what I love. That's so great. That's so great. Hillary, of course, your odyssey with injury is well-documented. You of course had a near death fall in the middle of a race a few years ago. You've been dealt some adversity since then as well. You wrote an amazing book about the whole thing. It's called Out and Back. Everybody watching this should read it. It is a phenomenal book. And you have inspired me so much. We had a long conversation about this on your Instagram live. You do a really cool series called The Comeback Club. Oh, look, Corinne's got the book right there at her desk. Everybody go out and buy Out and Back by Hillary Allen. It's a phenomenal book. But Hillary, I don't want you to have to like explain your whole journey again. Most of the people who will be watching this, I'm sure are familiar, but maybe any takeaways that you've had about like how injury has maybe made you a better person or allowed you to deal with adversity better. Yeah, thanks for that, Dylan. And um, yeah, I mean, the case in point is, uh, you know, injuries suck, they are hard. Um, they never get easier. You know, I even wrote a book about it. And every time I'm injured again, since then, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a, it's, there's something that make me really, you know, contemplate deeply, um, feel everything very intensely. Um, and I think at the end of the day, really there are opportunities to learn something. As Caitlin said, you know, she's embracing this change and she's learning new things, whether it's new sports or other activities that have nothing to do with sport. And I think that's important to do regardless if you're injured or not is to maintain that balance. And so injuries for me can sometimes be a hard reminder that I need to 
you know, feed those other parts of me that make me me, not just the athletic side of it. And um, I mean, since we're a panel of women, um, I think it's actually really interesting to talk about injuries and what that looks like for women specifically. I mean, our physiology is different. And so I actually have learned in real time in my athletic career how I need to train differently, not only from recovering from an injury, but moving forward and trying to prevent injuries. Um, you know, talking about stress fractures and and you know, I'm coming back from a fracture in my foot and you know, looking at that diagnosis I've had, you know, to to figure out what this is about. Of course, it's related to my change biomechanics from my fall, but it's also looking at, okay, if I'm an endurance athlete how do I best set myself up for continued recovery, um, you know, while training so much. Um, and for me, that always involves, you know, good nutrition, um, but really looking at timing of nutrition. Um, if anyone hasn't read this book, uh, Roar by Dr. Stacey Sims, it's a, it's a game changer. Um, and so that's always something that I try to emphasize for myself, um, you know, with my coach and I, when we talk, but um, to anyone else is that, you know, you're every, every individual is different, but women are also different. Um, when it comes to training, training load, we can't train like men. So we can't, we certainly can't recover like them either. Um, and that's not a bad thing. That's just, that's an awesome thing. Um, and so that's something I'm continuing to learn. And, um, you know, maybe that's, book number two, who knows? <laughs> Hillary, that's so great. And it tees up Corinne so well. Corinne, of course, you're coming back from injury as well. Hillary mentioned Stacy Sims and her book Roar. And I think it's Stacy who's famous for saying that women aren't small men, they're different. Corinne, you're a coach, you're a scientist, you're coming back from injury as well. And I'm really just curious, I'd love for you guys to just be able to share you know, the, the women's specific side of the experience. And so Corinne, yeah, where, wherever you want to take that, we'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah. So injury sucks, right? We're all like, welcome to our injury panel. For men, for men and women. That's the one thing. That's okay, the yes. same, yeah. It sucks for everyone. <laughs> welcome to our injury panel. You didn't know you were coming to it. Um, but I've always prided myself on being like a durable athlete that I like, you know, when I say eat well, I mean, I eat a lot type of thing. Um, and you know, I ran the TRT last October, it's 171 miles. I was like, yeah, I'm durable. I can handle this. Um, and then this winter, um, months later was kind of adding some speed back into my routine and something felt off. And suddenly it turned out that I had bilateral, bilateral stress reactions in my pubic rami and a non-displaced stress fracture, um, kind of right off like lateral of my pubic symphysis. So just like the, my pelvic, my, my pelvis was not in a good place. Um, but, and injuries look different for everyone. Like there's definitely, you know, when, when you break something like your femur or your pelvis or your sacrum, there's always questions like, where is this coming from? Because those are big bones to break. They're pretty unusual. And it's normally a combination of factors. And, and one for a lot of people, you know, is, relative energy deficiency in sport or red S or reds. Um, Stacy talks about this a lot. Emily Krauss, who's a bones, like a bone stress injury expert out of Stanford talks about this a lot. And I don't, you know, I wouldn't consider myself someone who falls into like the camp of like, Oh, I've got a dietary issue. But when you train a lot and you demand a lot from your body, it's really hard. Even if you are eating what should be adequate, it might not be adequate. And it, it like it takes a lot of energy for your bones to continue to lay down new bone. Um, so it can creep up on you, even if it's not, you know, even if you're not struggling with, a, with disordered eating or, or an eating disorder, you can still be in this reds camp, um, which I think is, and it's prevalent in both men and women. That's why they've developed red S or reds is because it's not just, you know, the female athlete triad that we've heard about for years and years. Mm. Um, that is further compounded though. So like my injury specifically, I've actually been seeing a pelvic, um, a pelvic floor PT, which is, you know, something that generally it's, you know, reserved for pregnant women or women who have just given birth, yeah. but it turns out, you know, like you can have dysfunction, um, without, you know, without going through the miracle of, of bringing new life into this world. And so, um, you know, totally new, um, realm for me. And I feel so fortunate to know PTs who specialize in this. And I think, um, for men and women, you know, like understanding how your pelvic floor works and holds together can be really, really valuable. And so, yeah, I've been seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist during this because that's part, part of my injury essentially was probably like some tension and some, 
some muscles not doing what they were supposed to do. So, um, you know, it's going to look different for everyone, but you know, I would say, don't, don't, you know, be worried to stretch what you thought was necessary in order to, you know, get to the bottom of what, what's, what's going on. Um, I think it's really easy to, you know, rub some dirt on it and take six weeks off and just jump right back in. But I think all of us here have experienced injuries, particularly these bone stress injuries have, you know, learned the lessons of, of taking time and letting your body do what it needs to recover because recovery takes a lot of energy. Yeah. And so the demands of training are, are a lot. So give yourself time to, to fully heal and to fully recover and enjoy doing other stuff. Like I've been riding my bike a lot too, and it's, um, been entirely enjoyable to get out and do something very, very different, um, over the last like several months at this point. Great. Well, let's move away from injury, but I, I'd love to sort of stay on this subject of women specific stuff, because I think one of all of our goals as a, as a group here is to continue to see the women's side of our sport grow and develop and have more and more both professional and sort of participant, uh, but, you know, both ends of the, the sport sort of continue to grow and develop as they have. Uh, and especially in the last few years, it's been really exciting to see. And there's been, I put out sort of like uh, some questions on Instagram to see sort of what people wanted to hear from. And of course, one of the major themes was, was nutrition and actually women's specific nutrition. So I'll just open this up to the group here. If anybody wants to talk about women's specific nutrition, Hillary, it sounds like you have something to say. <laughs> Go ahead. I'd love to learn more about this. Yay. Okay. So first of all, I'm not, I'm not an expert. Um, but I mean, the background, I come from a background of a lot of curiosity. My father's a food science human nutritionist that's like doing research and kind of the foods that you eat and how it affects you from a biochemical point of view. Um, and my background as a chemist, um, this is, a, this is like a passion subject of mine. Um, but again, some of these things, um, again, from Dr. Stacey Sims, um, some of the things that I've learned through, again, injury recovery is like Corinne mentioned, you know, you might not be a typical, a woman might not be, or a man might not be a typical um, example for low, like low energy availability, red S, right? Um, but um there might be, it's, it's, it's not about just eating more. It's really about the timing of that nutrition. So in this, in this trend that we see about like fat adapted fasted runs, that is never a good idea for a woman to do because women actually do better in a non-fasted state. And this doesn't mean that you have to gorge yourself. It just means that you need to be more cognizant of the timing of your nutrition. So that's before also during anything longer than an hour, you should actually be eating anywhere between 80 to 150 calories per hour. And then making sure that you time your meal, maybe not, you know, if it's at a meal time, but you should time your nutrition after, after you finish exercising. So, um, that basically getting some, basically feeding those muscles that have been working so hard and then kind of getting that cortisol out of your system, because too much of that actually can seep calcium from your bones and lead to these bone stress. Oh, injuries. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So something like that. I've, I've been learning about this. Another thing, again, you know, just reading all of these things, uh, carbo loading, it's actually less efficient for, for women to do. Um, you know, it's not a myth from the eighties. It still works, but man, like men, you can do that, but women, you know, we, it doesn't work for us as efficiently. And if kind of you think about it, like men have more muscle mass, they have, um, the ability to kind of store a bit more glycogen than, than mm -hmm. women do with our smaller frames. And, you know, we don't have as much muscle, um, but yeah, so stuff like that that's specific to women. And just to kind of what, you know, Corinne was saying, and I think, you know, Morgan and Caitlin is that like, you need a team, you need people that are on, like, that you can kind of trust and talk about these things with. So whether it's, you know, a coach like Corinne, or myself, or, you know, like your PT, someone that Caitlin's seen, like, it's you need these people on your team to talk through these problems and who are willing to know that you're different. Um, and you're kind of, you're this end of one, um, like little experiment. Um, and yeah, something I'm really passionate about to try to educate not only myself, but, um, you know, others and particularly women about kind of our differences and yeah. Yeah. yeah brilliant. And also fascinating and something also that I've thought about a lot in that I don't understand like the intermittent fasting people, because I feel so much better when I eat breakfast before I go running. <laughs> 
So anyway, that's yeah. Uh, don't probably, do it. Just yeah, eat yeah. food. Like yeah, even if, just, you, if you if you want to run fast, you got to practice running fast, and you need carbs to do it. So bring it on. <laughs> thank you. Well coached, Hillary. Well coached. So let's talk more about training. Of course, this is another really popular subject of people who wanted to hear from you all. And I think one of the interesting ways that we could take this question is sort of allow Morgan and Caitlin to take kind of two sides of, you know, their, or just provide their perspective just based on the types of athletes they are. Of course, Morgan, as we said, you're three-time champion of the vertical kilometer at Broken Arrow. You've won the 26K. So maybe talk about how you would approach training specifically for the shorter distance mountain races. And then Caitlin, maybe we'll go to you for something more like the, the 52K of Broken Arrow. Yeah, I think, um, you know, something specific like the vertical kilometer is you really just have to be efficient at going uphill. And that just means practice sing it I think one advantage of as a Nordic skier um, I know you long distance people call them wizard sticks but I call them poles um, I'm good at hiking with poles uh, good at power hiking because we just did a lot of that in training and there's really only one way to do it it's just practice so maybe it's once a week if you only have weekends off you find a ski mountain or a big hill and you get good at just power hiking or even when I was working in the hospitals I would always take the stairs and just like skip a stair and power hike the stairs um so things like that and then doing you know some shorter harder intervals um just to get used to being in that pain cave for you know 45 to 50 minutes. Um, can you provide an example? So when you, when you're yeah. practicing with your poles and you do your once a week, are, is that a hard effort uphill and maybe talk about maybe what sort of intervals you would do for something like a VK? Yeah, I guess if I was going to pick, like, if you're going to have two harder running specific sessions a week, maybe the long one up the mountain is a sustained, in my Nordic ski mind, I would call it like a level three, but that like close to red line, but you're never redlining for, you know, 25 to 35 minutes and really getting in that rhythm and um, kind of just settling into that slightly uncomfortable pace. And then if you, you know, if you're working during the weekend, you maybe only have 45 minutes or an hour doing some shorter stuff like two on, two off or something that's a little bit harder. Um, ben True is a friend of mine. We actually Nordic skied first before he got really fast. Well, he was always really fast at running. He's before, amazing. He's, yeah. He's, I, 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 he's one of my favorite athletes. I love he's, Ben True. Yeah. He's just a good human too, but um, he was always a fan of the two on two off back in our Nordic skiing days. Sorry, my dog's barking. That's okay. And, so is um, that, is that like two minutes full gas followed by two minutes, kind of easy recovery, that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe when you first start him out doing like four uh, sets of two on two off and then working up to like eight by two on two off uh, up a pretty decent grade. And I think something too, that's good is learning to recover while still moving. I see a lot of people stop after intervals and it's like, just keep, keep jogging for those two minutes. It's trying to, you know, be efficient in your recovery too. Um, and yeah. then just practicing with poles. And if you aren't comfortable with poles, then don't decide you're going to use them on the day of the race at broken arrow. You, I've seen a lot of that. And I think this year it'll be different because there won't be snow, um, which poles might actually be good the whole way. Um, mm -hmm. it's hard to say. Uh, but yeah, I think kind of the theme, it's like anything with nutrition, which is a big can of worms that you open there. That's brave of you, Dylan. <laughs> well, um, I usually avoid this subject, but <laughs> people love hearing about it. So. Uh, but I think people need to find also what works for them with nutrition, with training. Like my day is not the same as someone else's day. It's not the same as someone else's breakfast bowl or whatever, you know, um, if you're one of those people that's not hungry right away in the morning and you can, you know, go out for 30 minutes and eating makes you feel sick, then maybe you are one of those mm -hmm. people that doesn't need to eat right away. But some people wake up hungry and you should eat if you're hungry. It's yeah. that intuitive nature that I think uh, a lot of people lose as they read 
and Google things. <laughs> yeah, good point. It brings up something that I always think is hilarious. And that is that we want to make a shirt at Pillars that just says, nutrition is the politics of ultra running. So that, uh, <laughs> you know, we get, get the point across that it is the, the can of worms. But I appreciate, and it is really interesting to, to learn about the, the women's specific side of things. And uh, I love the, the two on two off workout myself. I usually do those or three on three offs to sort of get back into shape. And I think uh, an important thing for people to consider who are watching this is that even though, you know, specific, I mean, Morgan, you're sort of doing the VKs and the 26 Ks, but a lot of people who are motivated to do sort of trail and ultra running, it is really important to still get those really hard, harder efforts in occasionally throughout the year as well. So Caitlin, let's throw it to you. Maybe talk about what you would do or what you're planning to do specifically as you build up to the 52 K, what kind of workouts you do and just the training question in general. Yeah. So actually, I mean, a lot of the things that Morgan said, I think applies to the longer distance stuff too. Um, with the caveat that I think the specificity is a little bit different, right? So Morgan was mentioning like a lot of specific kind of workouts for building strength for going uphill for a short amount of time. Um, for doing something longer, like a 52 K where you're going to be out there for hours and, um, you know, doing some of that speed work is great, but I think also just building some of that strength and endurance so that your body is prepared to handle the up and downhills, especially in the second half of the race. Um, and so I'll actually you know, take it a little bit <laughs> differently that there's some other things I think like nutrition, I'll go back to that. Cause that's like a key <laughs> like part of all of this is like, you know, it's not always natural to feel hungry when you're out running, but as you're running for hours, like you need to be eating. And I think, um, that's one thing that, um, especially as you're kind of getting into the longer distances or even like at altitude or heat and exposure. So if people are traveling from different places, I'm really getting prepared by training your stomach to be able to handle calories while you're out running. Um, and I think there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, and it's something I've had to experiment with a lot myself, but just finding things that work for you. And again, you know, what works for me is not going to work for Hillary or Morgan or Corinne. It's just kind of experimenting with different ways to get, um, get good calories. And while you're, while you're moving, um, another thing that'll be different too, is just what you're bringing with you, what you're packing, um, and, preparing for that. So especially as, as people are, you know, doing longer runs. So especially like I would typically fit for a 52 K, you know, be building up different training blocks where I'm increasing the length of my runs. Um, and also, you know, maybe doing a back-to-back -back run on, on a weekend. Cause that's when I have most of my training time. Um, but just figuring out like what different sorts of things you need to start bringing with you when you're out, um, in a mountain environment. And so, you know, having a pack, training with carrying that water weight and a water filter and a first aid kit and a small, you know, a jacket and those kinds of essentials. Um, so that, you know, you're building that kind of core strength and, and upper body strength to, to really be able to handle that over a longer period of time. Terrific. So we're coming up on an hour here. I figure we just kind of close with maybe a quick round the horn bit of advice for people who are signing up for Broken Arrow this year. I know three of the, out of the four of you, our coaches, Morgan, you're a Nordic ski coach, Caitlin, you're not a coach, but you're a scientist and you've done a lot of this stuff. So maybe let's go around the horn, just a very quick bit of advice for our listeners before we sign off for the night. Hillary, you want to go first? Yep. And I will say, remember to look around and smile because you're out there to have fun and it's freaking beautiful. Corinne. Yeah, I feel like we're all going to say similar things. Don't don't be stressed. Don't be scared. You can do it. Like if you're like, "Oh, is 52k or whatever too much?" No, it's not. You're going to be fine. Like it's it's okay to try new things that scare you. Scary goals are good goals and it's okay to fail. So like sign up, come out. It's going to be epic and insane and really beautiful and snow free. Um, which is a, a difference this year. Um so don't be worried about slipping around on snow, but yeah, just don't like, I think a lot of people stop themselves from doing things that they can do because they're afraid to try and because they're worried about failing. So don't be afraid to fail. Come, come fail with us. Love that. Love that. Morgan. Yeah. I think, um, one of my new favorite kind of self mantras, which applies to every, a lot of things is to be, uh, 
sorry, my dog sounds like a pig and he is full of it. We, um, we can't is, hear him. Oh, good. Is <laughs> to, uh, to be curious and not critical. And so even if you're out there suffering and you feel like crap during intervals or whatever it is, be curious about it, but don't beat yourself up about it. And um, I think just ask people questions too. I mean, I think everyone in, on the screen here, you could send us a message on Instagram or whatever and say, hey, I have this specific question and I'm pretty sure all of us would answer. Uh, I don't know. I don't, we're not an intimidating bunch, I don't think. So I think, um, yeah, just use your resources and don't be afraid. Love that. Curious, not critical. Caitlin, close us out. Yeah, I, just a reminder to have fun with it. Have fun with the training and have fun with the race because, you know, I think for a lot of us, Broken Arrow might be the first race that most people have done in a year and a half, two years. Um, you know, so don't stress about the training. Find fun routes that you want to do that maybe you wanted to do for a long time. Fit that in as part of your training as a way to have fun and explore with it. And, and yeah, just have a good time because that's why we're, that's why we do it, right? So great. Thank you guys so much for that amazing perspective. We ended it on a super positive, optimistic note with amazing advice. So thanks everyone for being here. Just want to remind our viewers, we're also going to be doing a men's panel on July 28th. So make sure you come and listen to that. It's going to be a lot of fun as well. If you are interested in signing up for the Broken Arrow Sky Race, please do visit brokenarrowskyrace.com. There are still some uh, spots available at some of the distances. I spoke to Brendan Madigan today, the race director, and he said there could be a lot of movement on the wait lists as well. So if you want to sign up for the races that currently have a wait list, please do. There's a good chance that you could get in. They're also going to be doing some fun sort of virtual clinics with the guys from Trails and Tarmac, an awesome outfit of coaches. Um, so Keep your eye on the Broken Arrow Sky Race social media channels so you can stay apprised of that. To plug our stuff, again, my name is Dylan Bowman. You can listen to my podcast, The Pillars Podcast. We have a really awesome training app uh, that you can find on both iOS and Android. Come join our community if you need help with your training. We'd love to get you set up for Broken Arrow or anything else. I think that's it. For Hillary Allen, Corinne Malcolm, Morgan Aratola and Caitlin Gerben. I am Dylan Bowman. Hope you guys have a great night. You too. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>